Well, well, welcome everyone to Hidden Truth. So today we have Josh Barone, who is going to speak about the turmoil that is currently happening in Europe and in some other areas of the world. Hi, Josh. How's everything going? I'm great. How are you? I'm mean, great. Thanks. So actually, I just came back from Europe. I was there for the last two weeks. And yes, there is turmoil. Yes, there is civil unrest in Europe, in different parts of Europe. I was in France, I was in Italy, and the same type of concern was expressed to me by people who live there. That turmoil also is in Asia. Lots of challenges with energy costs. What can you tell us about those? Well, so this weekend, I think was, if you were in Europe this weekend, you saw it. But there was a lot of protests this weekend in Europe, three or four of them that were significant, at least 70,000 people in the Czech Republic, similar size rallies in Germany. And I think there was a few in Indonesia, as well as I think they're scheduled to have some in Italy. And the one thing that these all have in common is the price of energy and the cost of living is skyrocketed in the Eurozone. I, we're talking about, I think in the UK, they were talking about 22% inflation. And it's all energy related back to sanctions on Russia over Ukraine. The populace isn't starting, at least the European populace is starting to have problems with these sanctions. Obviously, as you know, their businesses are closing, factories are closing because the cost of energy is too great and it's not worth doing anything. I saw in the Netherlands, they were talking about throwing away whole crops because the cost of the energy to put into the, they can't make any money. That's really the base of, of these protests. Now that kind of gets into some other things. I think you were talking to me about a taxi driver upset about having to pay 800 euros for an oil change. You hear stories like that everywhere. People cannot afford air conditioning. If they do have air conditioning, they have to cut on those basic uh, costs. They have to cut some of their expenses so that they can afford buying food. It's as basic as that. Yeah. So your basic needs, it's a basic need. You have to scamper down and give money where you have it. I did hear about subsidies coming in places like the UK, that opens a whole nother bag of worms, whether the government should print money to give to the populace to deal with the energy costs or just deal with them head on. And this is what people do in Europe. They are used to getting this type of government subsidies. And if they don't get it, they go on strike. And if they go on strike, then it shuts off a lot of their industries. For example, the travel business, right? You see a lot of travel challenges now where Luggage is not transported the way it should be because they don't have enough workers. They go on strike. What's happening right now with energy is it's creating a snowball effect on a lot of different areas. And I think people don't realize is that governments change much faster there than they do. Like in the U.S., the U.S. will have a president for four years or, you know, Congress people for their terms. In, in Europe, it's all multi-party with coalitions. And if the coalitions break, then they go to re-election. So you can see a lot of governments change. You just saw the UK change their prime minister. And the new prime minister seems, the first speech I heard, seems pretty sharp, actually. What are the governments there doing about the civil unrest? The thing about the governments there, you have to understand that there's kind of three different things going on. There's the Eurozone, which is 27 countries. There's NATO, which is 30 countries, and there's the G7. Now, the G7 are the largest economic countries by defined by the IMF. You're talking about U.S., France, Germany, Japan, and a few others. I probably left a few out there. But um, there's what they're doing is when NATO, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, NATO got involved and, and got countries to put sanctions on those countries being the EU and, and the U.S. and a few other bodies, foreign bodies, but the EU being the most important. Now, when the EU puts a sanction on, they need everybody to vote for it. They, if somebody doesn't vote for it, the sanction doesn't go on. They have time periods to these sanctions. The new time period is the sanctions come off and need to be re-voted on is December 5th. You have Hungary not wanting to agree with the sanctions, which is probably correct. But with all this turmoil in, in these rallies, you might have some other countries not want to put sanctions on 
either. Europe gets its energy from Russia. Russia's turned it off because of the sanctions and other issues over to Ukraine. So what you have here is the G7 coming out. That Think of the G7 as mainly the U.S. driving the G7, because that's kind of how it is. And the G7 is going to put price caps on Russian oil. <laughs> it's kind of laughable because if you're in Europe, then you realize you're a price taker, not a price setter. That's kind of an important concept. If you're begging somebody for something because you don't have enough of it, you'll pay whatever price it is. You're a price taker. If you're like, yeah, I got enough. I, I don't need, then you can kind of set, but I'll take it for this price. You're a price setter. Europe right now is a price taker. They'll, they'll pay whatever it is to get it in because they need to heat their houses and feed their populace. So what you have is the G7 saying, we're going to put price caps on Russian oil. Here's the funny thing. It only works it's if all the countries that need this go along with that price cap. How do you get Europe to go along with the price cap when winter is coming and they need to keep their houses? It's very difficult. Essentially, what the G7 is telling me is that the EU sanctions are about to roll off and they don't think they're going to go back on. And the U.S. is trying to figure a way to punish Russia for the Ukraine. That's the big takeaway here. Essentially, what you're going to see is sanctions ease against Russia because Europe really has no choice but to let that oil back in. You know, they're talking about oil going to China and then being shipped back to Europe because essentially it's not Russian oil anymore, it's Chinese oil. And, and that's somewhat ridiculous. Just take the sanction off, bring it in, and then go forward and maybe figure a way to get off their oil in the long term. And that's really what's going to have to happen here. Right. But so getting back to the, the, the sanctions have not worked, obviously, right? You were in Europe. You saw how bad it is. Why would you sanction yourself to death over a, a, essentially a non-NATO packed country? You know, I get it. You don't want Russia to do whatever they feel like they can do. But it, it's really worked and the sanctions have really reverse worked in the other direction. Russia's GDP is growing rapidly and its currency is getting stronger against the dollar, not the other way around. They're not seeing problems in their economy like we think they should. Mm -hmm. Well, it was interesting when I was there, actually, the day I arrived, the French president had just flown to Algeria to negotiate buying oil because they tried to find different ways of getting around. Okay, we cannot get all oil at a decent price in Russia. Let's see what we can do with, with other countries that potentially could supply us with what we need. People are, uh, governments are, are getting very creative and finding ways to, to overcome what's happening. President Biden was giving hand pumps to the president of Saudi Arabia negotiating with Venezuela. They're talking about doing a deal in Iran. It's all to free up oil. And what they're not talking about is discovering it or using the resources that we have in the U.S. So the whole LNG trade has changed. Prior to Ukraine, the best LNG route was from Australia to Japan because after Fukushima, Japan had turned off all its nuclear power and went strictly to natural gas, but they don't have natural gas so they have to import it. So LNG isn't the most efficient use of natural gas. You have to cool it down massively to liquefy it, and that's not cost-effective. The differential prices between what you could buy natural gas in Australia and what you could sell for in Japan was massive, so they were doing that. You have to have specialized ships to move LNG around the world. What happened is those specialized ships, when they just started cutting off the gas to Europe, went from Louisiana now to Europe because that was the best differential market. And they got rid of the Japanese market. And that's why you saw the Japanese go back and flip on their nuclear plants because the cost of natural gas there went through the roof because of the European trade. But don't forget, there's not enough specialty ships to actually make it work very well yet. It takes two or three years to build a ship. Maybe it's a little faster than that, but that's what it used to be. And all the ships are typically made in South Korea. If you watch South Korea's economy, it's not doing well either. It's all kind of imploding. The real choices here are coming. The EU has a choice to redo its sanctions on December 5th or not. And so it looks like they're not going to, I think they'll have real problems getting those sanctions to pass and the world 
they'll go back to hopefully get Russian oil. Now, the Russians have come out and said, hey, if you put a price cap on it, we're not going to sell to you. And not only that, the Russians will only accept payment in rubles to prop up their currency. They don't want euros. And I don't want euros right now either. So I can understand that. So they said, hey, look, if you put price caps, we're not going to sell to you. It really puts pressure on Germany, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Because they're the G7. They want to put price caps on. And once the sanctions are off, then they still don't get the natural gas and oil they need to, to turn their mechanical machine manufacturing on. None of these sanctions are going to work. The price caps aren't going to work. It seems a bit humorous to me, but that's the world we live in. Yeah, no, that's exactly what's happening. And I think a lot of countries are really trying to detach themselves from Russia. They don't want any type of dependence from Russia. They're scared. They really in fear right now. A lot of them told me, you're very lucky to be in the United States. You're far away from, from what's happening here. We feel like anything can happen from one day to the other. And there's so much uncertainty that it is de deeply impacting the economy. It is deeply impacting the type of investments we, we had planned on making. There's a couple of things there. So green bonds. Europe is very much carbon credit traded. You have to stay green. All of a sudden, green bonds are being issued for nuclear power. Is, is that green? They've adjusted their definition of green to suit their situations. Two, we're talking about 22% inflation year over year over there. Not what the U.S. was facing where everybody's screaming and it was only, you know, nine-ish, Right. And so you can imagine twice as much inflation in the Eurozone right now than we were facing at the peak, which we're coming off of right now. And it looks like they're going to have more inflation going forward. When we talk, I think we were talking in earlier podcasts, I really said, I didn't really think that Europe was going to go into recession. I thought it'd be more like a depression. It sounds like your experience over there, is that's what they're really worried about. Like, how far does this go? And you have to remember, this is all NATO sanctions against Russia for invading a non-NATO country, which they want to make NATO. I saw an interesting statistic the other day. Essentially, the U.S. government has given enough money to Ukraine to give 50, every Ukrainian $1,500. That's a lot of money. I've said this before. I'd love to see an accounting of it. I'd love to see where it actually went. Because I don't think it's gone to where we think as U.S. citizens it should have gone to. And, and I think that's a big administrative problem. What I do know is that the EU is very much in trouble and they can talk about solutions, but there's one solution and that is to buy oil from Russia directly. That's what they may be forced to do. They have to be creative. They have to be flexible. And they're used to it. Winter is coming. We'll see what they do. Right. Great. Well, thank you, Josh. What would you like to leave your, your viewers with today? I really do believe that sanctions haven't worked and it has to do with the nature of sanctions. If you can't physically embargo that country, those sanctions are not going to work. Those sanctions will come off and that will change the outlook for the EU going forward. The outlook's bad until they figure that out, but when they do and they will, then we'll see what happens. Got it. Well, thank you so much for your insight. Great information, very valuable. Everyone, if you would like to have more of this type of information, this type of videos, go to YouTube and we'll put a link here to the channel. Subscribe to the channel so that the information comes right into your inbox. You don't have to look for it. And then share with your network. This is valuable information that can be very helpful to many people who are trying to get advice on the economy and on what to do with their money. Thank you again and see you next time. Thank you.